I've lived in Southern California my entire life. If you know anything about California, it's very diverse. Up north is filled with mountains and trees, and the south is a lot more, well, city-like. This summer, I decided to take a trip to Lake Tahoe. It's a beautiful place, and my first time being upstate. On day one, I settled into the cabin at around 5 p.m. after an eight-hour drive. I was very tired. I went and lay down in the bed that was in the loft. It was quiet. It was like being in a different world. I was so used to cars zooming by and people talking right outside my house. But it was quiet. I fell asleep fairly quickly. Around four hours into my sleep, I jerked up. I looked around for a bit before hearing a strange tapping sound. I looked around to see where it was coming from, but to no avail. It sounded like someone was tapping on the part of the window of the back door. I figured I was just paranoid and fell back to sleep. On day two, nothing happened this day and I slept fine. On day three, I woke up early in the morning. Maybe at four, I heard a crashing sound coming from the attic ladder, which was placed conveniently right behind the couch I was sleeping on. I didn't move. I heard a few footsteps. You know that feeling you get when you feel someone staring at you? That's how I felt. I was on my side, staring straight ahead. Suddenly, I felt somebody or something crawl over me. I felt their two hands on either sides of me, and I knew their face was inches away from mine. Like I said, I was facing straight ahead, and I wasn't going to turn my face to see who it was. They stayed there for what felt like forever, until I felt them crawl backwards, and then off the couch, I heard the dog let out a muffled bark in which someone shushed her and then let out good girl. The person stayed there for what felt like an eternity till I heard footsteps going out the back door. Still, I didn't move. I was paralyzed with fear. Needless to say, I didn't go back to sleep. I checked on my friends a bit later. When I felt the coast was clear, none of them had left their rooms that night. I told them my experience, and they said I was being paranoid. I halfway agreed with them, and our day went on as planned. Later that day, after the day with my friends on the lake, we came back to a quiet and cozy cabin. The caretakers of the cabin told us there was a river a bit farther back into the woods, about a 15 minute walk. My friends decided to stay back and rest, so I took some bug spray and a small backpack with snacks in my phone. It was a pretty straightforward trail. There was tall grass on either side of the trail. It was a thin path, but pretty easy to navigate. When I got to the riverbank, there were two picnic tables. I didn't want to get eaten by mosquitoes, but I stupidly wore sandals. I put my bag on the table and started to walk back to the cabin for some odd reason. The path seemed distorted. What was once a straightforward trail was now covered in rough terrain. I noticed the tall grass on the side of the path had been disturbed. It was as if something huge, and I mean gigantic, had walked across the long grass. At first, I thought maybe it was a bear, since the locals had told us that bears were a problem this time of year, but the sheer size of it made me second guess that. 
I was a little taken aback by this. However, I continued and made it back to the cabin, then back to the river. I was a little frightened now, and I kept telling myself I was just freaking myself out, and I should enjoy the nature. I sat down on one of the tables and watched the river. After a while, I felt like there was something staring at me. I looked around, assuming one of my friends was on their way to prank me, but there was no one. Across the river, I noticed a bit of brush that was shaken up. There was a clearing in the bushes that was fenced off by two logs in an X shape. The longer I sat in that spot, the more worried I got. I couldn't help but feel like there was something behind the thick brush that I couldn't see. I went down the river, hoping to come across some kind of life, but nothing. No fish, no frogs, no roads, just mosquitoes and a bunch of them at that. Disappointed with the lack of anything, really, I went to sit back at the table, and that's when I heard it. It was a noise I can't really describe. It was a scream, but a gurgle. As if whatever it was had a mouthful of water. It was inhumane, and I froze. In the moment, I should have been running for my life, but I just froze. I heard rustling in the bushes behind me, the ones I was worried about earlier. Then again, the scream. It was the loudest thing I've ever heard. Run. And so I did. I sprinted my ass through the forest. What should have been a quick trip back to the cabin was anything but. After about ten minutes of sprinting, I noticed I was lost. I stopped for a few moments, frantic, to see if I could find anything that looked familiar. I saw a bridge that I had crossed on my way there. And I started sprinting. I thought to myself, why didn't the damn thing kill me? I had stopped for a good minute, but I could hear it chasing me. It was a game for the damn thing. Every time I stopped, it would as well. I finally made it back to my cabin, and instead of going inside, I stood on the porch and I faced the forest. And I cried. I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary, but I knew it was still out there. I didn't want to turn my back to it, so I sat there for hours, silently crying, occasionally checking my phone and, well, writing this. I don't know what the hell that thing was. The only thing I could even compare it to is a Wendigo. All I know is that I will not be going back to that river ever again. I signed up for a trip to gather samples for an experiment some students in the ecology department were going to run. It required the collection of samples from several sites, so they recruited biology, ecology, and forestry majors to help them complete sampling in a shorter period. The area my group was to take samples from was a few hours from my uni in the Pacific Northwest. There are nine of us in my group, eight students and a supervising professor. We got to the camp in the late evening and set up our tents. One of the other students had brought a big container of split pea soup from home and was sharing it with the others on the trip. I don't really care for split pea soup, so I declined the offer. Everyone had some except me, one other student and the professor. Come the next morning, the five students who had eaten the soup weren't in the best shape. They were in the grips of some gnarly food poisoning and were in no shape to hike for eight or nine hours to collect the samples we needed. The professor, who was supervising us, 
had originally some rules, such as people travel in groups of at least two, and we had to return to camp by nightfall. Now those rules were just tossed out to make sure we kept our timetable and collected all of the required samples. We were just told to do your best to complete the work assigned as long as you can do it safely. That morning, I set out for a long day of hiking. After a mile or so, I ran into the stream I was supposed to follow. I needed to travel about four miles upstream, stopping every quarter mile to collect samples from the water and soil. This meant I had to hustle to get back before dark. Halfway through the day, I realized this wasn't going to happen. About two miles into the hike, I stopped for lunch, sitting on a log overlooking the stream. The scene was really peaceful until I smelled the cigarettes. It wasn't the smell of a cigarette being smoked, more the musty smell of a heavy smoker's car where cigarette butts have been left to ferment for weeks on end. I looked around, but couldn't see anyone. I just assumed that the wind had blown the scent of some hunter or hiker over to me. But minutes later, that smell hadn't faded. The vegetation in the area wasn't that thick, but there was still a lot of places for someone to duck behind, like a tree or bush. I was unnerved that someone was apparently staying close enough to me for me to smell them for this long without so much as a word. I quickly packed up the trash for my lunch and continued upstream. The musty cigarette smell went away for the next few hours. It wasn't until I arrived at my last sample location late into dusk that I smelled it again. The woods were getting really dim by this point. Looking back on it, it was a really stupid idea to stay out so late. I was just hiking back to camp in the dark it would be pretty dangerous, even without a cigarette smoking stalker. Having just put up the collection of tubes in my bag, I shined my flashlight around the darkening woods, looking for whoever was giving off the smell. I didn't see anything that caught my attention. It would actually be more correct to say I saw too many things in the dim light that might have been a head sticking out from behind a tree or someone crouched low in the foliage. I didn't like the idea of being in the dark woods with a stranger who for the second time was lurking near me without revealing themselves. So I began to double time it back down the stream. I made much better time on my way back, even though it was dark, because I didn't have to stop to take any samples. And even so, I didn't get back to camp till a bit before 10. I was the last one to get back, and everyone but the professor was already asleep. I didn't mention the cigarette smell to the professor because he seemed tired as it was and he headed to his bed in the RV soon after I got back. I headed to my tent soon after. At some point in the night, I woke up needing to pee. I decided to head into the woods to do my business. As I knew some of the other students were still feeling ill and needed the RV toilet for more urgent matters than just having to take a leak. I walked about a hundred feet into the woods, found a tree, and did what I needed to. As I turned to go back to camp, something caught my eye. Somewhere off in the woods, there was a tiny, red glow. I was confused as to what it was, until it flared momentarily, and I realized it was the cherry of a cigarette. I stood there for a while, watching the red ember glow fade, then move slightly closer to the ground, as whoever it was smoking would take it out of their mouth. 
not being able to see the person. I assumed they were watching the camp. I didn't know if they had seen me make my way into the woods or not, as the fire had been doused, and the moon was only half full, so there wasn't much light. I made my way slowly back to the camp, as quietly as I could, and entered the RV to wake up the professor. I told him about the person smoking in the woods, and about the smell of cigarettes earlier that day. However, when we got outside the RV, the ember from the cigarette was gone. My professor woke the other student, who had come down with food poisoning, and we took turns watching over camp. I didn't see or smell anything else when I was on guard duty and went to sleep when the professor woke up for his turn. In the morning, the professor, the other student, and I went to where I had guessed the smoker had been standing the night before. And sure enough, we found about ten cigarette butts on the ground next to a tree. The tree itself looked like someone had been twisting and stabbing a knife or other sharp object into it as the bark and outer layer of the woods had been damaged and chipped away. And the professor decided that the group should head back that day. And even though we hadn't collected all the samples we were assigned to be on the safe side, we packed up camp and drove down the thin dirt trail without incident. And the second we got onto the paved highway though, a white, paneled van pulled out of a clearing just off the shoulder and began following us. This van stayed behind us all the way back, pulling off the highway when we did, taking the same surface streets that we did, and only stopped following us when we turned off to our road, leading to our university campus. Everyone was freaked out by this, but it was around nine at night on a weekend, so the security office on the campus was closed. We decided to unload the RV and call it a night, as the van hadn't followed us onto the campus. I offered to help the professor catalog and store the collection tubes from our trip, so it was another couple hours before I left the biological sciences building and started heading toward the dorm building I lived in. I stepped out into the cool night air and began walking. My professor, having left the building in another direction to get to his car and drive home, it was a couple dozen feet outside of the building, which was now locked, when I was hit with the musty smell of old cigarettes. I looked around, and about 25 yards away, in the darkness, off of the footpath, I saw the cherry of a cigarette smoldering away. I was pretty scared at this point, but hoped it was only a student or some faculty staying late, having a smoke. I couldn't completely convince myself of this, as the musty cigarette smell was the same I smelled in the woods the previous night. I started down the footpath and soon passed whoever was smoking. A hundred feet or so later, I looked over my shoulder and saw the cigarette cherry bobbing in the darkness. The smoker was following me. This creeped me out a bit more, but I still held it together. That is until I rounded a small stand of trees and saw a white paneled van parked alone in the parking lot. I took off at a sprint toward my dorm building. I looked over my shoulder a few steps into my run and I saw the cherry of the cigarette fall to the ground and a dark shape beginning to move after me. I didn't look back again, but I could hear someone running in the grass off the footpath. 
I got to the entrance of my dorm building and frantically waved my keycard in front of the card reader that controlled the door lock. As soon as I hear the soft beep, I open the door, jump through the doorway, and shut the door quickly. I stopped and peered through the glass door. I saw the dark shape stop just short of the lit pathway. I just watched for a minute or two. Then I saw the spark of a lighter. The light is just barely bright enough to illuminate a shaggy beard and the brim of a baseball cap before it disappears and was replaced with the red glow of a cigarette. I turned and headed up the stairs to my dorm room. By the time I get to my window, overlooking the same yard I had just run through, there was no trace of a dark figure or a cigarette cherry. After that, I didn't see that white panel fan again or smell that musty cigarette smell, and I hope I never do. Years ago, when I was still a teenager, my friend Justin and I would often go out longboarding at night, as my friends and I were quite the night owls. We loved the freedom of almost never seeing another soul on the roads, or the paths we frequented. Even when we were using main roads, it would be very rare to see a car out so late in such a rural area, and you could see and hear them coming from very far away due to the headlights and the noise of the vehicles disrupting the peaceful silence of the night. We were really into it at the time, and would often ride our boards for miles and miles, sometimes not arriving home until the sun was up. One particular night, we decided to ride a few miles away from our usual back roads to take one of our favorite hidden routes. It began with a narrow, paved path that was the only piece of land separating the two sides of a long lake. It would often sink under due to rain and we wanted to seize the opportunity to use it before it rained and went underwater again. It was roughly two miles long and was extremely relaxing to ride through due to the scenery. After making it to the end of the lake, we decided to continue moving and turn into a very close path that leads directly into a densely wooded wilderness preservation. As we came up to the first hill, we looked down at the bottom into the blackness. We both noticed what appeared to be a tiny moving ball of dim light down there. It moved so strangely and it was extremely difficult to make out what it was. Rather than shine our flashlight down, we curiously watched it for a few moments, whispering to each other about what it could possibly be. All at once, the small light turned into multiple blinding lights and extremely loud revving sounds, overwhelming our senses that had become accustomed to the dark and silence. Acting purely out of fear, we instantly turned around and ran as fast as we could, hearing yelling and revving gaining behind us. By sheer luck, we managed to run off the path into a very dark, very overgrown hole in the side of a hill overlooking where we had just come from. We decided to hide in the natural dugout of this hill, hoping that plants and darkness would be enough to protect us from whatever was happening out there. We watched our pursuers ride up to where we had originally been standing. There were four men, two on four-wheelers, and two on full-size motorcycles. They were yelling at each other about something, but we couldn't make out what they were saying due to the distance we had covered. We felt safe enough to whisper very softly to each other and speculated who these people could be. Our first thought was that they might be park rangers of some kind, although we had never seen one here in the many times we had been through, and honestly, we doubted that this county had the budget or even the desire to have anyone patrol the deep woods at night. Besides that, these men were on vehicles entirely inappropriate for paved bike trails, and they were angry about something. 
and they called out to us for a while, yelling things like, We know you're out there, and we can see you, come on out. We stayed silent and decided to call their bluff instead of running. Eventually, we clearly heard one of the men yell, Find them now, and smash a bottle. They had erased any hope we had that these were just park rangers. We watched them split up, each of them going a different way down the series of paths on their vehicles, including the path we came from. It took us what felt like ages to even move. We were frozen in terror inside that dugout, watching the lights from the vehicles travel through the woods and paths. One of them already coming full circle and passing the point he started from. I thought about calling for help, but I was too afraid to open my phone in fear that even the smallest amount of light would give away our location. After waiting for the lights of the vehicles to reach the farthest distance yet, we finally summoned the nerve to get up and try to run somewhere far enough from these people to safely make a call. We ran as hard and fast as we could through the woods. Since their headlights gave away the location on these paths, we would hide again whenever we felt they were getting too close. Our available hiding spots were getting progressively worse as the woods became less dense. And the fear I felt, waiting for one of them to drive past us, while basically only being covered in leaves and plants, may still be unmatched to this day. Finally, we emerged from the woods onto the intersection of two main roads, far from where we started. We ducked down into the ditch to call for help. When I opened my phone, I noticed I had received missed calls from one of our other friends, Connor, who we were supposed to meet up with after our longboard excursion. I called him and frantically asked where he was. Luck was with us again. He hadn't given up on our plans, despite us ignoring him, and was only a few miles away, already heading in our direction. I gave him the names of the two streets we were near the corner of and explained that we needed to be picked up right away. He agreed to speed over to us, while Justin and I were waiting and hiding. Thankfully, Connor arrived before any of those men did. We bolted into the back seats of his car yelling for him to get out of there, and he took off. Relief doesn't begin to describe what I felt, being safely driven home after everything I had just experienced. After explaining everything that happened to Connor, we ended up just moving on with our night and decided not to call the police. We figured they would be gone by the time any officer made it out there and that we would only be putting ourselves at risk by admitting to breaking the law, by taking those paths so late at night. I still have no idea what happened or who those people were. I've been told all kinds of theories from friends and family that have heard this story. Some think we walked right up to a huge drug deal. Justin and I later admitted to each other that when the revving started, we couldn't see our minds both went straight to chainsaw wielding horror movie serial killer. So I suppose it could have been much worse. Frustratingly enough, whatever those men thought we saw, that made them want to catch us so badly we never actually saw. We'll never really know, I suppose. Back in 2015, I had the choice of getting a dog and getting a smartphone. I had never had a dog in my life, or a decent phone come to think of it. And I'd been saving up for a new phone anyhow, so naturally, I picked a dog. My dad knew a fella who had a couple of border collies that had recently had a litter. So we drove out and the dude gave me his last pup, Enter Bailey. A couple of weeks after he got his shots, I started walking him. My parents figured I was going to be hanging out at the local park with my new pup so I could get him socialized, but no. 
I chose to take him around the perimeter of a nearby farm to keep the farm dog in him. I'd been sneaking out to this farm for years. The farmer was an old family friend. My uncles had grown up working for him, so I knew if I was ever caught, I could just drop their name. On either side of the farm, there was some thick woodland, which no one had ever given me reason to be wary of. They probably should have. So, it's a sunny afternoon. It had been pouring down all week, and Bailey was itching for a good walk. I take him to the farm at our usual time, and we start making our way around the woods on the east side of the farm. Everything is quiet, but Bailey keeps starting away from me to explore. He's a puppy. It's what they do, of course. I'd been calling his name all the way around the field. We're about halfway past the woods. I could see the roof of the farmhouse over the next hill. Bailey's been pulling crap out of the brushes all the way along. And I just got him into trouble for rolling in a pile of fox crap. That's when I hear a man's voice calling my dog by his name. Like this dude I didn't even know was calling my dog by name. I knew it wasn't the farmer, because I'd met him at family events, like barbecues and weddings, etc. So I knew what his voice sounded like. I go completely silent. But the guy keeps calling my dog. It sounds like he's deep into the woods, and maybe moving. He's calling my dog with an excited tone in his voice, which is what creeps me out the most. Bailey, meanwhile, is completely ignoring this guy and sniffing the now flat pile of crap. I'm like a tiny 18 year old girl. The most combat experience I have is a month learning Taekwondo when I was 11 and I don't have a mobile phone. If that guy works out where I am, I'm fucked. And if Bailey decides to go in after him, I'm double fucked. Because I am not letting a possible psycho get his hands on my puppy. I can either run to the farm, which isn't too far away, or run back through the fields towards home. I pick up my dog and sprint across the field. Behind me, I hear someone emerge from the woods, but I'm already over the fence and sprinting back home with my puppy tucked under my arm. I get home and tell my mom. She brushes it off as some weird drunk guy. A few weeks later, I'm at my uncle's house and the farmer walks in. I told my uncle what had happened, so he brings it up. The farmer asks, exactly which woods I had been close to, and that some of his clothes had gone missing from his washing line. He put it down to strong winds, but now he's not sure. I take him and my uncle to the exact spot the next day, and all three of us go in and find a completely wrecked campsite. There's no clothes or anything but the tent had collapsed in on itself. There's no fire, but there are some empty gas canisters, like you'd use for a portable stove, and empty packets of food scattered everywhere. We report it to the police, but nothing ever really comes of it, except that I got a phone not long after, and keep it on me whenever I go out. I have two Australian Shepherds. One is my personal dog, and the other is a foster dog. Both are roughly 60 pounds. I took them on a walk today at a local wilderness area that consists of about 50 miles of trails in total. I've been there many times with just my dog and never had any problems. 
Anyways, we're walking down the trail, and they do bark at a few people we see. Every time I see someone, we step to the side of the trail and let them pass. I apologize for them. The person smiles and keeps walking, and we all carry on. So, when I see this one guy approaching, the dogs go into alert mode, and we step off so he could pass. He gets up to us and stops and says, Oh, I don't think you dogs like me. I told him, no, they're just nervous. I apologize for them being so loud. And at this point, I'm holding them by their harnesses. So they're super close to me, but they're going crazy, angry barking, lunging, growling, etc. I know that's not great behavior. But nonetheless, he tells me, I'm sorry they don't like me. I'm so sorry. At this point, I'm weirded out, because he's not broken eye contact, and seems rather unfazed by the dogs. I tell him again it's okay, not his fault, and I tell the dogs, let's go, and begin to guide them away. He says he's going to keep moseying up the trail. I say, all right, and tell him to have a good day, and we walk off in opposite directions. I thought it was a strange interaction, but hey, we can all be a little weird. So I didn't think much on it. About two minutes later though, I hear him call out from behind me, and I turn around to see him approaching. He says, I really just want to be friends with your dogs. No, I don't want to leave them on bad terms, and I want to make friends as he keeps walking up. When I come up on nervous dogs, I leave them alone, or if I do try to make friends, I squat down, talk gently to them, extend a hand, etc. He never did this though, and I swear, he never even looked at my dogs, because he kept looking at me the whole time. This time, the dogs are going absolutely nuts again, but I don't try to grab the harness. I let them have the full length of the leash to put some distance between us and the man. He keeps telling me repeatedly he just wants to be friends. I tell him I don't think it'll happen, that they're just not there yet. He does try to approach still, but the dogs have none of that. He eventually says, I'm sorry. I don't think they're going to be friends with me. But again, he isn't even looking at the dogs. So I tell him, no, they're not. And they won't be letting him get any closer. He finally turns and leaves, and I call my sister for the remainder of the walk. So, is it annoying that my dogs freak out over the mailman? Or the neighbors? Or a knocking noise on the TV show? Yes. Yes, it is. I don't know for a fact this man today had bad intentions, but I'm damn sure glad they were there and made it abundantly clear he wasn't getting near me. I'll probably work with them on calming down quicker, but I have no plans to have them befriend strangers at first sight. Hey guys, thanks for joining me in today's episode. Let me know in the comments if you've enjoyed it. And if you have, then leave me a like. And for all first timers here, go on and hit that subscribe button. And also, turn the notifications on, so whenever I upload a new video, you'll be notified straight away. I'm just starting to get accustomed to Twitter, so if you don't mind, go ahead and give me a follow. I do also have a subreddit, so if you guys do have any stories, and fancy letting me know, and possibly featuring in a future video. Go on and let me know there. All my links are in the description. Thanks again, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Catch you later.